Hey, welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today I have the new MSI Z270 Gaming M7 motherboard on hand, and I'm pretty excited about it because this is my first MSI 200 series motherboard, and it looks to be a real weapon. Part of the excitement is down to the fact that the MSI Z170A Gaming M7 just so happened to be one of the best value high-end Z170 motherboards that I laid my hands on. Back in its heyday, this Z170 motherboard retailed for, I believe it was around 210 US or 320 Aussie, and the now updated Z270 version is selling for 240 US or 400 Aussie, making it a good bit more expensive. Well, when compared to the previous model, you do get quite a lot of extras. The CPU and DDR4 memory now features a digital PWM. There is an extra M.2 slot, AS Media Lightning USB 3.1, seven controllable fan headers compared to the previous two, upgraded audio and U.2 connectivity. There are other upgrades as well, so let's get on with it. Like all new motherboards priced over $150 US, this thing has enough RGB LED lights to put your Christmas tree to shame. They're pretty much everywhere, and unfortunately though, a lot of this aesthetic goodness, I feel, comes at the expense of performance. Take the 11 phase power solution for example. Like most motherboards, the power delivery system is cooled via large passive heat sinks to ensure optimal operating temperatures under full load. That's great, and MSI's military class 5 implementation features fancy pants, titanium chokes, dark caps, and all that good stuff. However, the issue I have with this implementation is that those nice big passive heat sinks designed to keep the power delivery stuff cool, even when overclocking, has been covered or almost insulated in plastic. These passive heat sinks rely on air movement generated by case fans to keep them cool. Covering their entire surface area in plastic seems somewhat counterproductive. It's a bit disappointing to see form take priority over function here, and especially on such a high-end motherboard. I decided to check how much of an impact the plastic shroud had on thermal performance. With a 120mm fan blowing air over the motherboard, the heatsink covering the VRM reached a temperature of 46 degrees Celsius. This temperature was recorded using a non-contact infrared thermometer. The Core i5-7600K processor was also overclocked to 4.8 GHz and placed under full load during this test. So honestly, a heatsink temperature of 46 degrees isn't exactly extreme. I also measured the top of the titanium chokes at 40 degrees. Removing the plastic shroud and retesting saw the heatsink temp drop by 6 degrees down to 40 degrees. The chokes also dropped from 40 degrees down to 37 degrees. These are fairly significant temperatures, despite the fact that with the shroud installed, I wouldn't have called the original figures dangerous. Still, the point of these high-end enthusiast-grade motherboards is that they come with the very best components that are meant to offer greater efficiency and therefore, crucially, lower operating temperatures. So again, covering them in plastic seems to go against everything this board stands for. Thankfully, the heatsink cooling the Z270 chip isn't also covered in plastic, and instead MSI has gone with an aluminium shroud to house the LED lighting here. Under maximum system load, this heatsink reached just 34 degrees. By the way, for those wondering, the ambient room temperature was just 21 degrees during this testing, so the plastic shroud could become a bigger issue in warmer climates. The last of the RGB LED madness can be found around the PCI expansion slots. Here MSI has installed what they call matching gaming IO and audio cover with RGB LEDs. The bling here doesn't seem to be hurting anyone, so I don't have a problem with this light show. An interesting feature that upon first inspection I thought, hey that's pretty cool, is MSI's M.2 shield. MSI advertised this as a device for keeping your M.2 SSD cool while also protecting it. MSI says that, and I quote, the M2 shield features cooling pads to lower the temperature of your M.2 device and avoid any possible throttling, causing it to slow down. Sounds simple enough, and it sounds pretty good. However, there are a few glaring issues here. Firstly, the heat shield, as they call it, only makes contact with the top side of the SSD. So for double-sided M.2 SSDs, this isn't particularly useful, though admittedly the controller is usually found on the top side. The included thermal pad appears woefully insufficient, and it's at this point you realise this might be more of a gimmick than anything else. Worse still, Luscious Lock Steve over at Gamers Nexus looked into the M.2 shield and did some really nice testing. He found that it actually increases the operating temperature of M.2 drives. So it seems like the M.2 shield might just trap heat and limit the airflow to your SSD, so that's unfortunate. 
After speaking with MSI about this issue, they insisted that their internal testing shows improved SSD thermals, and they were quick to point out that other reviews, such as the one over at BitTech, also found significant temperature improvements with the M.2 shield. In fact, BitTech reported a 10 degree lower operating temp on their Samsung SSD 960 EVO with the shield installed, and that's pretty amazing. So with that, I had to look into this further. Since BitTech used the Samsung SSD 960 EVO 500GB, I thought I might as well do the same. On an open air test bed with no direct airflow, so we are relying purely on natural convection, without the shield installed, the EVO got as hot as 71 degrees. With the shield installed, we sadly didn't see temperatures drop by 10 degrees, rather, just a single degree. Still, it didn't make the SSD hotter like the gamer's Nexus results suggested. That said, I ran a second test inside a computer case with a fan directing airflow past the graphics card, and this was sending some cool air the 960 EVO's way. Operating temperatures were reduced significantly. The SSD was now peaking at just 47 degrees with the shield removed. Installing the shield under the same conditions actually increased the operating temperature to 49 degrees, a 2 degree increase, and this is similar to what Steve over at Gamers Nexus saw. So it seems when there is little to no airflow, the M.2 shield might be useful, or at least it doesn't hurt. However, with a small amount of airflow, the M.2 shield seems to hurt thermal performance, if only slightly. Okay, so I'll admit this is all sounding a bit negative so far, but that's because I'm waiting to get to the good stuff, which thankfully is pretty much everything else. With the M.2 shield being a bit of a bust, I recommend removing it, which thankfully can be done quickly and easily. In total, there are three M.2 ports, all offering PCIe 3.0x4 bandwidth. The first slot situated above the primary PCIe x16 slot supports up to 110mm long M.2 devices, while the following two ports will accept up to 80mm long devices. Apart from the three M.2 slots, you get the standard 6 SATA 6 gigabit per second ports, along with a U.2 connector. MSI has wrapped this connector with their steel armor, which is meant to increase durability and reduce interference. It probably doesn't hurt that it looks kind of cool as well. Anyway, this connector should come in handy for those connecting next generation SSDs as it delivers up to 32 gigabits per second of bandwidth per device. Moving on from storage to audio, we find MSI's Audio Boost solution. Whereas ASRock employs Creative Sound Blaster Cinema 3 software, MSI is going with Nahemix Audio software. Cinema 3 worked well when I tested the ASRock Fatality Z270 Gaming ITX motherboard, so I was keen to see how Nahemix 2 compared. Sadly, I never got the chance. The software simply wouldn't install. Although the audio was working and the latest Realtek drivers were installed, the Nahemix software install failed, claiming that the Realtek audio driver must be installed first. So following a tutorial on the Nehemic forums, I used an uninstaller from IOBit and removed the Realtek drivers. Then after rebooting, installing the Realtek audio drivers supplied by MSI, I tried again. Unfortunately, this was to no avail as I ran into the same error once again. At this point, I tried a few other things before giving up and moving on. It seems I'm not alone here either. Heaps of MSI users are reporting trouble getting their software installed. There is also a concerning amount of users who have successfully installed the software but claim it causes their games to crash. So for now this doesn't look great for the Nehemic 2 software and I'll have to look into this a bit later. Moving past that disappointment, we find that like ASRock's higher-end Z270 motherboards, MSI has isolated the audio hardware on a separate section of the PCB to avoid interference. They've also placed the left and right audio channels on a separate layer to reduce crosstalk. Something rather unique and very odd about MSI's audio implementation is the fact that it employs not one, but two Realtek ALC1220 codecs. Moreover, each audio codec receives its own dedicated amplifier. So why has MSI done this? As far as I can tell, this has been done so that the user can simultaneously use their speakers and headphones, which is kind of cool. When it comes to USB 3 connectivity, the Z270 Gaming M7 delivers. The I.O. panel supports a pair of USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports, a Type-A and Type-C port, along with a pair of Gen 1 Type-A ports. For legacy support, MSI has included three rinky-dinky USB 2.0 ports as well. Meanwhile, via onboard headers, it's possible to add another four USB 2.0 ports, two USB 3.1 ports, and a single Gen 2 3.1 Type-C port. I should note that this board doesn't use an Intel Thunderbolt controller, so Thunderbolt 3 support doesn't exist. Even MSI's USB implementation gets a special touch-up from the marketing guys. The two USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type-A ports featured below the Gigabit Ethernet port are VR-ready, 
VR ready USB ports. Okay, I'm starting to get dizzy at this point. Connected to these USB ports is the VR boost chip. MSI claims that traditional USB ports can suffer signal drops, significantly impacting the performance of connected devices. MSI also says that VR boost is a smart chip that ensures a clean and strong signal to the VR optimized USB ports, giving you an enjoyable VR experience. This is yet another feature we can't really test, so I guess we'll just have to take their word for it. Also around at the IO panel, we find a single PS2 port, which we could happily drop in favor of some extra USB 3 ports. There's a CMOS reset button, display port, and HDMI outputs, gigabit ethernet connection, which is driven by a killer E2500 controller and five audio jacks, along with an optical audio output as well. So that pretty much covers all the important features. Let's take a look at the UEFI BIOS. For those of you wondering, this is a single BIOS job using a 128 megabit American Megatrends UEFI BIOS flash ROM. As we found when testing the new ASRock Z270 motherboards, MSI has also gone with a very similar design and layout to that of their Z170 models. Also like the ASRock boards, MSI has now added an easy BIOS mode, which probably isn't necessary on the enthusiast grade motherboard, but we have it anyway. Skipping the easy BIOS mode lands us in the advanced BIOS, and now we can get things done. As you might have guessed, all the real action takes place in the OC menu. Now we could just bump the CPU ratio up to 49 times and then add a little voltage like we did on ASRock Z270 Mini ITX board. But for this review, let's try an MSI feature called Game Boost, which is essentially automated overclocking. Game Boost can be enabled at the BIOS level, and typically this is how I prefer to do all my overclocking. But surprisingly, this feature doesn't provide much information on what it's actually doing here. For far better control and information, it's best to install and use the MSI command center within Windows. I have to admit, while not a fan of overclocking and tweaking within the Windows operating system, the MSI command center is brilliant. The level of control that it offers is impressive and users can tune their CPU, DRAM and even integrated graphics processor if they wish. The Game Boost menu provides more detail on what it is that each setting does. With the Core i5-7600K installed, we have seven overclocking profiles that are oddly numbered. Anyway, each one steps up the operating frequency by 100 megahertz. My Core i5-7600K processor failed the Set 11 option, which would have seen it run at 4.9 gigahertz. That said, the Set 10 option worked fine, and here the processor seemed to operate at between 4.7 and 4.8 gigahertz, depending on the load. Stability was excellent, though temperatures were high, as this setting applies 1.4 volts. My 7600K chip can run happily at 4.9 GHz using 1.3 volts, so while the Game Boost feature does work well, you are still best off fine-tuning the overclock. Complementing the command center is the little MSI gaming app, which can be used to overclock your MSI graphics card, as well as tinker with the LED lights. Sadly, the lighting options for the Z270 Gaming M7 are very basic, which are seven color choices and some boring effects. So, the RGB lighting options and effects do leave quite a bit to be desired. Overall, the MSI Z270 Gaming M7 is a great motherboard, despite the few frustrating design flaws. On that note, I have to say the marketing gimmicks or jargon or whatever you want to call it have gotten out of hand uh, with the motherboard makers lately and all the added bling these days has made it probably a bit harder to swallow or at least take them seriously. Uh, but let me be clear, I'm not singling MSI out here. They all do it. I guess I'm just disappointed that MSI has compromised on cooling to look cool. I should point out though that ASRock has also included some plastic shroud stuff over their VRM heat sinks on the Z270 Extreme 4 and Z270 Gaming K6 boards, though they haven't covered them entirely so they are, they are still getting a fair bit of airflow and on the higher end Gaming K6 model they have used heat pipes to join the heat sinks together which has improved uh, the thermal performance. Actually, it's interesting to think that 10 years ago, copper heat pipes were all a rage amongst motherboard makers. I remember boards such as the ASUS P5K Deluxe, which were littered with heat pipes. The older viewers might also remember ABIT. Their IP35 Pro was another Intel P35 motherboard with an interesting cooling setup that took full advantage of heat pipes. Back in the day, the heat pipe craze did get a little out of hand thanks to the marketing machine, but for the most part, they did help with thermal performance, so enthusiasts welcomed them. Fast forward to today and it's all about flashy lights. Honestly, I don't really mind the RGB craze that much and I have to admit that the MSI Z270 Gaming M7 is a very cool looking motherboard. Certainly one of the best I've seen. I just wish the bling didn't come at the expense of cooling performance. Maybe I'm banging on about this too much, the temperatures certainly never got out of hand and they didn't compromise the stability of our Core i5-7600K overclock. I guess I just like to see well-refined designs that are highly optimized for thermal performance. 
The M.2 shield is another pointless gimmick, but you can just use one of the other M.2 slots and leave it in place if you think it looks cool. Of course, if you wish to install three M.2 SSDs, then you can simply remove the shield altogether. The Nehemic 2 software also looks a bit dicey at this point, though I would have liked the chance to check it out for myself. I will try to resolve this issue soon when I have a bit more time to spend troubleshooting it. Still, even without the Nehemic audio software installed, I can confirm that the MSI Z270 Gaming M7 provides exceptional audio quality. MSI's own software is excellent, and I was particularly impressed with the command center. The only letdown here was again the LED lighting. Sadly, there are just a few color options to choose from rather than an entire spectrum of RGB color. Colors. With the exception of that plastic shroud, I have to say the board design and layout is excellent. The Gaming M7 also offers a very solid feature set, making it quite good value at the $240 US or $400 Aussie asking price. In a nutshell, what I liked about MSI Z270 Gaming M7 was the appearance, the dual audio codecs, the 2 amp liquid cooling pump header, all the steel armor bits, they were nice, the triple M.2 support, the U.2 connectivity, the abundance of USB 3.1 ports, and that front panel uh, USB 3.1 Type-C headers nice, the automated game boost overclocking, and MSI's command center software. Right, so I'm gonna end this review here. Please let me know what you guys think about MSI Z270 Gaming M7. As always, I'm very keen to hear your thoughts, and I'm particularly interested to see what you make of that plastic shroud. Is it not really a big deal and you prefer the lighting, or is it something that needs to go? I'm your host, Steve, and I'll catch you on the next one.